Hi there, Gemma here. Um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to say a few short things based on certain observations I've had in recent times. In Nigeria, where I grew up, uh, we used to have a saying, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. I'll repeat that. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Now, I'm not suicidal. I'm not asking anyone to die for me. I'm not looking to die myself. But everybody or many people seem to forget that there is only one of two ways in which a person can pass on into eternity. The Lord snatches him. And in particular, this is with respect to the rapture, but it has happened before. Um, we know the story of Enoch, according to Genesis chapter 5, I believe, um, where it goes through the genealogy of Adam to Noah. And, um, and we see how that he walked with God for 300 years after he turned the age of 65. And it was not because God took him. And God did indeed take him. He didn't die. But the point is, in general, there's only two ways to go to heaven. The Lord takes you or you die. And actually, in the second case, the Lord also takes you because... Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, let me not digress too much because that, that would just be on a long diatribe. Um, but the point is, to go to heaven, a person has to be taken by the Lord. By death, by rapture, however it happens, the Lord has to take that person. The reason I, I use that phrase is that Everybody's clinging on to life, and for understandable reasons. Um, um, and you know what I'm talking about when I say everybody's clinging on to life, especially the, the scourge of, um, of this disease, right? This pandemic, right? Um, people are clinging on to life for dear life. They're clinging on to it. They're, they're following all the rules. They are um, queuing up to take um, the shots or the jabs. Uh, because they want to preserve life. In fact, um, I saw a person who's 91 um, take the jab. And um, I mean, the thought went through my head. That person really must have a very optimistic view of life because um, I'll be honest with you, if I was 91, um, I'd want, I've been wanting to hasten my journey away from this planet. Personally, I'm just speaking for myself. I'm not speaking for anyone else. I'm speaking purely for myself. If I was 91, Odds are, I mean, if I was 91, my kids at that time would probably be in their, in their late 50s, early 60s. I would be looking to go personally, right? Um, I, as far as I'm concerned, I would have lived my life, you know, I would have enjoyed, suffered, um, done everything under the sun that, that was required to do. I, w I don't think there would be much left on my bucket list for me to want to hang around on this planet. But that is me. I'm not saying that is everybody. In fact... I don't think that is everybody, and that's the reason why I'm saying this. People want to preserve their lives. And again, I use that phrase. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. But let me read to you something that Jesus said. In Mark chapter 8, in verse 34, he says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35 is actually where I'm going to. It says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall, will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall, save, shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Now, the, the reason why I'm reading this to you and I'm talking about this, sorry, my uh, eyes are itching there. The reason why I'm saying this to you is because People are so desperate to preserve this physical life, which is infinitesimal compared with the life on the other side, that it boggles the mind that people do not rush forward to salvation. People are so determined to save or to preserve whatever years they have left in this life that they are they forget that there is a life beyond this life. It's like they're so concerned about this life. They're so concerned about preserving whatever years of life they have left in this life that they forget or ignore the next life. I mean, it would have even been better if they were concerned about preserving this life, but were also preparing for the next life. But no, most people are just eagerly, desperately preserving themselves for this life and this life alone. 
And in part, it's because this is life, this life is all they see, this life is all they know. But they forget that there is a life beyond this life. There is a world beyond this world. There is an eternity beyond this time and space that we exist in, that we dwell in. People forget that there is a God who on that day is going to call every person by name and we are going to give an account of the lives that we have lived in this life. People forget that this life is a dress rehearsal for eternity. This life is a dress rehearsal for a, an infinite amount of time of living, of living either in darkness and torment and hell and fire where the worms do not die or an infinite amount of time and actually the word time will exist no longer of bliss and peace and prosperity and blessing and abundance and copious amounts of everything good both imagined and unimagined the ones that you know and are familiar with and the ones that you have never ever experienced in your lives before these two things people seem to be casually walking toward that time when they're going to cross over from this side of eternity onto the other side of eternity when we will experience eternity in all his or its fullness they are trying to preserve themselves for this life and that's why jesus says for what shall it profit a man verse 36 of matthew chapter 8 oh sorry mark chapter 8 for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul many people talk about the wealth of the likes of um, um steve jobs who's passed away now bill gates warren buffett mark zuckerberg um, um jeff bezos um nikola uh, sorry not nikola tesla um, um elon musk right they talk about all these billionaires and people are looking to become millionaires and looking to become billionaires I, I i filled out a survey tonight and it was asking me what's your net worth and i was like that is a very difficult question because i'm thinking is my net worth in terms of what i have in the bank which is very little or is my net worth premised on how god views me what is my net worth and jesus is saying here what does it profit a man to gain the whole world if you become a billionaire, a trillionaire? People say about Jeff Bezos that he's the richest man ever in history. I beg to differ. The richest man ever in history was a guy called Solomon. They should go out and read about him in the Bible. But anyway, imagine. let us even imagine that it was true. That Jeff Bezos is the richest man ever in the history of humanity. The point is, what does it get, profit a man? What does it profit Jeff Bezos to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? What? Look at what he says in, in um, Luke chapter 9, verses 24 to 26. It says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. One, one other place says, Whosoever will lose his life for my sake and for the gospels, the same shall save it. For what is it what for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. In um, what's it called? In Luke 17, 32 and 33, he says, Remember Lot's wife. So if you remember the story of Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. At the time that the angels came to rescue them from Sodom and Gomorrah before God's judgment came down, these two girls were engaged, they were betrothed to a couple of, um, okay, you know, when you mention the word Sodomite today, you think about um, the act of sodomy or those who engage in the act of sodomy. And they perhaps engaged in the act of sodomy. But in, in, back in those days, a Sodomite was simply a person who came from Sodom, right? Um, I don't know what a, somebody who came from Gomorrah would be, maybe a Gomorrite or, or Gomorrah, doesn't matter. Right, now, now these, these, this family was rescued 
in part on the premise of their relationship with Abraham, but in part because God had God had somewhat of a relationship with Lot himself, even though it was not as strong as the relationship that um, he had with Abraham. Okay, and he rescues Lot, takes Lot out. The angels tell Lot and his family, "Do not look back." And 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 Lot's wife, whether because of nostalgia or because she was thinking about what she would miss, or she was looking longingly at their old house as as the as the um, the flames came down, as the 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 liquid fire came down, as the fire brimstone came down, uh, she looked back for whatever reason. She looked back, and the Bible tells us she was turned into a pillar of salt, and that's why it says here in verse thirty-two of Luke chapter seventeen. Remember Lot's wife. Now, there's a whole diatribe, a, a, a long conversation before that. And I'm not going to go into that just now. Um, but look at what it then says in verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. See, here is the thing I've come to realize about human beings. In fact, this pandemic has opened my eyes to how human beings think. Once upon a time, I read these two sets of scriptures in the book of Revelation, and I didn't understand how people could do this. So in Revelation 16, verse 8 and 9, it says, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And, the, and men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. The next, ver the next statement is the kicker. This is what shocked me, stunned me, and I wondered what exactly is going through these people's minds that they would do this. It says, and they repented not to give him glory. In other words, they could tell that this was God's judgment coming upon the earth, but they still refused to repent. Look at um, something similar happened in Revelation 9. So this is by this time, the seals have been opened, the, 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 the trumpets have been blown. We are inside the context of the seventh seal being opened, and then you know the, 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 the trumpets are being blown. So if you read, if, if we look at Revelation 9, verses 14 to 21, and all the scriptures, I'll put them in the description below. It says, saying to the sixth angel, Revelation 9, 14, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the and the four angels, oh, by the way, that, mean, that tells us that there are four angels currently bound in the great river Euphrates. But we'll come to there. We'll come to that another day. It says, and the four angels were loosed. Now, the fact that they were loosed gives me the impression, I could be wrong, but gives me the impression these guys are not exactly good guys. Because why would God buy or have good guys, good angels bound? These must be fallen angels who were bound in the river Euphrates. Now you know the river Euphrates is around the Iraq area. So there's something supernatural going on as we speak. But anyway, let's not digress. It says, And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And, oh, by the way, by this time, two billion people have already died, minimum, minimum, based on today's numbers, minimum two billion people will, would have died. And Another two billion are going to die by the hands of these four angels, um, according to what is read here or said here in Revelation 9:15. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand or two hundred million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in a vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which which issued out of their mouths what are that those are guns or rockets or missiles i don't know anyway it says for their for their power is in their mouth and in their tails for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands. Yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, 
which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Do you see something similar going on today? What am I saying? Despite the scourge, the apparent scourge of a disease which could kill people in droves, according to government figures published regularly by the papers, if you want to get depressed, read the papers every day. I promise you it is a question of when, not if, depression sets in. I'm hinting on the flip side that as much as you can, read the Bible instead of the papers because the, the papers will depress you. The Bible will lift you up. Amen. But what I'm really saying is this. Despite the scourge or the apparent scourge of a pandemic and people's zealous enthusiastic desire, their zeal in trying to protect themselves, their zeal in wearing their masks, their zeal in 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 running for the jab and, and running for, for whatever shots they need to take and so on, right? I mean, I had a person, um, and I, I, I didn't do this deliberately. I, I wasn't trying to walk into this person's personal space, but a person almost literally pushed me back and said, 2.5 meters, 2.5 meters. There was a part of me that was tempted to correct him and say, actually, it's two meters. But I was like, no, what, General, let it go. Let it go. Because it, they, you then sound like you're, you're, you're one of the crazies, okay? The point I'm making is that people are so desperate to preserve physical life. But they are indifferent about preserving the life that is really life. They are so determined to add a few more days, weeks, months, perhaps even years, but they completely ignore eternity. It's shocking. It's really shocking. But if this is heard by anybody who, all of a sudden it hits him, you know what, I need to prepare for eternity, then go read Romans 10, 9 to 11 and go on your knees and pray. Acknowledge you are a sinner Believe on the Lord Jesus that God raised him from the dead. Confess him as your Lord and you will be saved. The Bible tells us in John 3, 3, it says, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the, into the kingdom of God. Friends, there is a life beyond this life. There is a life that exceeds this life in length, in quality, in value, in bliss, in peace, in all the things you could ever desire or imagine and beyond even your imagination and even things that a person could never ever think about. And it's waiting because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Prepare for that life. Don't be so enamored with this life that you forget to seek and to cultivate yourself in the context of the next life. Be prepared for the next life. Don't concern yourself with this life as much as you should be concerned about the next life. God bless you.